There's a saying in Thailand that the tongue is close to the teeth, so it's likely to get bitten. They're talking about people who live in close proximity, in a family, in a monastery. It's very easy to get irritated with one another. This evening the question was raised, when you're spreading thoughts of goodwill, you start out with people who are close to you. And the person asking the question understood that as meaning people who are physically close to you. And as they told him, you're trying to start out with people who are easy to feel goodwill toward. And sometimes the people who are closest to you are the ones that are hardest to feel goodwill for when you get irritated by their behavior. And yet it's the most important that you treat them with goodwill and treat them with respect. One of the worst things for a community is where people lose respect for one another. start treating one another with disdain. And that's murder for any community. So the first thing we have to think about is that we're here practicing, and that in and of itself is something worthy of respect. But we're all coming from different places, different levels of skill in our practice. And just because someone doesn't live up to your standard doesn't mean they're not trying. You have to keep that into consideration. After all, none of us have been established to be the National Board of Standards. We're here to look after ourselves. It means learning to be skillful in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. And part of skill, especially in words and thoughts, is thinking in ways that lead to harmony. And we've heard many, many times that the antidote for anger and irritation is goodwill combined with equanimity. But just thinking thoughts of goodwill and thoughts of equanimity are not going to be enough. You have to learn how to think more precisely when you're feeling irritated, feeling angry. You've got something you've got to take apart. The Buddha recommends that you think of anger and other unskillful emotions as a stream. There's a current to the stream and it's flowing out. And the first thing you've got to do is stop the flow. He says, you do that with mindfulness, you hold it in check. Anger arises in the mind, you tell yourself, I'm not going to act or speak on this anger. And part of the mind will say, well, that other person really did something wrong. But the reason you're holding things in check is to remind yourself that you're suffering from the anger because of things in your own mind. That other person's behavior may be an excuse. But you have to ask yourself, sometimes you're primed for anger, and you would look for something to set you off. Which means you've got to turn and look at that stream flowing out of the mind. And you hold it in check. The more you can hold it in check, the better you get to see it, because it will complain. And it will give its reasons. If you flow along with it, it never has to give reasons doesn't have to justify itself. And so its reasons can be perfectly bad, but the fact that you're willing to give in means that you're never going to find out what those reasons are. That's the first thing. Hold your tongue. Hold back in your actions. And keep reminding yourself, when you act on anger, act on irritation, you tend to do things that you're later going to regret. So why do them? The moment of anger, you can say, oh, I'm justified by what this person did, what that person did. But if you have to justify your behavior, okay, there's something wrong. 
And sometimes we feel that other people's misbehavior gives us extraordinary rights to misbehave ourselves. But then it becomes your karma. So these are things you keep in mind to restrain yourself. But the actual solution is not in the mindfulness, it's going to be in the discernment. One of the reasons why we practice concentration is to get to know how the mind fabricates its experiences. We all know what the three fabrications are. There's the breath. That's in and out breath is bodily fabrication. Directed thought and evaluation, the way you talk to yourself is verbal fabrication. And the perceptions you hold in mind and the feelings that you focus on, those are mental fabrication. We engage in these in the meditation to create a state of concentration so we can become more and more sensitive in how the mind puts things together. Then you take that knowledge and you try to apply it. And John Fung had a student one time whose powers of concentration were very strong, but she complained it wasn't making any difference in her life. In fact, it seemed that the stronger her concentration got, the stronger her anger came when it when it came out. And as John Fung pointed out to her, you can't just depend on your concentration to calm things down like this. You've got to take what you've learned from your concentration and apply it. So you analyze the anger in the same three, three ways. How are you breathing when you're angry? How are you breathing when you're irritated? How are you talking to yourself? What are the things you choose to focus on and what do you say about them? And then what are the perceptions you hold in mind? Because a lot of these things go into what's called the allure of the anger, why you feel justified, why you like the anger. You know, the breathing itself may be unpleasant, and that's what gives you the sense of, well, I've got to get this out of my system. And sometimes you can stir things up pretty badly in the body by the way you breathe. It gives you more and more sense. You've just got to get it out. And then the way you talk to yourself about it. About how this person behaves this way, always behaves this way. And it's unbearable. And something's got to be done. We'll learn how to question that. And we do have the choice of how we talk about our experiences as we go through the day. And the way we talk about our experiences is not just in reaction to what we've experienced. It shapes what we're going to experience, too. So are you engaging in the kind of inner conversation that aggravates these things? A lot of that has to do with the perception. When you're irritated, when you're angry, sometimes that's a very strong sense of self operating there, a sense of your power, your ability to see what's wrong and say what's wrong and be a straight speaker, get it out. But is that the most effective way of dealing with the problem? I notice in time there are some ways when people were upset with the John Fuang. And he never used his power or authority. In fact, there were some times when he was very meek when people were criticizing him. And the fact that he was meek made you sympathize with him. So just because you have the power of anger doesn't mean that you're going to win. Sometimes a meek approach is the most effective. It disarms other people. But because you have this perception of yourself as being powerful when you're angry, it's getting in the way of actually seeing what is the most effective thing to do. Because the question should be, if there really is misbehavior, what is the most effective way of dealing with it? We had an old monk at the monastery he'd ordained during his retirement, and basically come to the monastery to live out his last years without doing much. He wasn't much of a meditator. But he'd like to brag about how he was beyond sensual desire. 
but he was the one who would like to talk about his old exploits with women. And it got to me. And one day I, I lashed out at him. And when he was bragging about how he was beyond sensual desire, I said, you're the only one who's talking about this kind of stuff around here. It's obvious that you've, it's a big issue for you. Well, he blew up. Word of this got to John Fuhr. He said, that's not the most effective way of dealing with that. You say, you may be beyond sensual desire, but when you talk about things like this, it affects me, it affects the rest of us. Could you please not do that? In other words, you take a more meek approach. And it was more effective. So you learn how to question your perceptions and say, well, now that I'm angry, I have the right to exert my power. And I can show some of my power to myself and other people. So you begin to realize that the anger has very little to do with clearing up a situation, and more has to do with your self-image. So you've got to look into that. This is what the dynamic of the Four Noble Truths is all about. Wherever there's suffering, turn around and look inside. Things outside may really be bad, but the suffering is not caused by the things outside. Look at dependent core arising. Suffering doesn't begin with unpleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Those come in the middle of the, the sequence. It's the things you bring to those sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations that determine whether you're going to suffer from it or not. The things you pay attention to, your intentions, your perceptions, your feelings. So the problem starts inside, and the outside aggravation is just an excuse to learn to look inside and see what you can do to take apart this mass of an emotion you develop through the way you breathe, through the way you talk to yourself, through the perceptions you hold in mind. Because you do have the choice. You can talk to yourself about other aspects of what's going on. This is why the Buddha has you think about times when the person you're angry at has actually done good things, changes the story. Because when you're angry at somebody for you know, some habit that drives you crazy, you say, why are you always doing that? Well, do they always do that? Well, no. If they're always doing that, they'd be insane. They may do it frequently, but there are other times when they do perfectly skillful things. Why are you stitching together the, the bad things? Well, it makes it easier to get angry. So look at how you talk to yourself about the situation. Remind yourself you can talk about it in a different way. What are the perceptions you're holding on? How true are those perceptions? And again, the best way to see these things is to put the dam of mindfulness across the stream. In other words, you're not going to act on the anger, you're not going to act on the irritation, and see how the mind complains. That's when you got to see its reasons. So when the streams of anger are flowing out, put up the dam, and then watch how the currents fight against the dam. And you learn a lot about the fluid dynamics of your defilements. And you can divert the energy behind them into a better direction.